So we'll go back to a person named Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. In 1969, wrote a book entitled On Death and Dying. She was the one that did a little classifying of experiences. So she had the five stages of death and dying. Now where did those come from? That came from her practice. And she wrote down in categories uh, the different stages of people dealing with death and dying. So this is not a formula like in a chemistry lab. This is the observation of somebody who had a lifetime of dealing with death and dying in hospital settings, out of which uh, I don't think, think she would take credit for it, but out of that came the hospice movement, which is uh, new to a lot of us my age. There was no hospice setting uh, when I was growing up. And hospice setting is something that's come in in the past 45 to 50 years and is now operative in almost every setting that I know of. Uh, hospice workers, hospice nurses, hospice counselors who come. Uh, I think it's a switch that people used to kind of have to die in hospitals. But now it's, uh, except for the sudden death, majority of people die in their home. And with the death in their home, there's the assistance of uh, the personnel who are trained in the hospice ministry. And they're very, very good. Uh, I remember talking to Father Jack Sloth about a week ago, last time I visited with him. He knew he was dying. All of us knew that he was dying. We just didn't know how many more hours and possibly days. It was five days later. But he said uh, very dramatically two or three times in that brief 30-minute discussion, uh, the hospice workers have been wonderful. But that's because they have a sense of understanding death and dying. And a lot of their background comes from this Dr. Kubler-Ross. So if you go, go on the, uh, the back side, I don't know which is the back side. These are the steps of death that she was very uh, well known for discussing and helping dealing with uh, death and dying. The first stage of grief is denial. Uh, I don't know how prominent it is now, but when I was first ordained, uh, many people just denied that they were dying, no matter what the evidence. And these are comments that I heard, and no doubt that she, the doctor says I'm dying, but I know I'm not. I'm not dying. Well, that's what's described as denial, and it's very easy for people to say, uh, I'm not going to die. It was a subject to one of our comedians who said, uh, just because everybody else before me has died, that doesn't mean I'm going to die. In fact, I'm going to drive out smoking a cigar in my white Cadillac. I think he was being humorous, but uh, that was his feeling. He was not going to die. So denial. Uh, it has no set time frame. It may never be felt at all. However, it is considered the first stage when you deny. Uh, probably today in the hospital setting would it come out in a more relative way, such as, uh, I know it's difficult, but I, I can survive this. I've survived a lot of difficulties, and I can survive this. So that's very common. Uh, priests have the difficulty when you anoint, give the anointing of the sick. You know, one of the functions of anointing of the sick is to give people the grace and understanding and comfort and consolation to live with what they are experiencing now. The other side of the anointing of the sick is when you know you're dying, but the proper sacrament for a time of death is viaticum, to go to communion. Uh, that's the last sacrament, via te cum, God be with you. And in the ritual, that's listed as the sacrament for the dying person. However, we kind of uh, blend together 
anointing of the sick as healing, the potential to be healed, pray to be healed, optimistic, you will be healed, but it's also administered in the time of death uh, frequently, although properly according to the liturgical laws of the church. If somebody knows they're dying, you know they're dying, the doctors have confirmed that there's not much hope of redeeming this stage of cancer or something like that, then you would uh, give them communion, the sacrament, anointing of the sick. That's one of the things uh, I have a difficult time with. Uh, if a person knows they're dying and they are not in denial, then you can deal with them in the hospital or in the hospice setting much more easily. But I would never go in to somebody uh, who is still optimistic about living, surviving this condition of cancer or whatever it is. Uh, I would never say, well, I'm going to give you the annoying of the sick because you're dying. You just have to be very, very sensitive about that. If they know they are, and they have been anointed perhaps three or four times, I'd probably say to them that the sacrament that the church gives in the time of death is Holy Communion, viaticum, God be with you, via te cum, on your journey to be with you. So that's one of the stages that she found in her work, and that's one of the stages that all of us find, is that there's uh, a sense of denial that in many cases works into a, a, a stage of acceptance. But denial is part. That's it's very difficult for a family, uh, for loved ones to uh, work through this. Uh, kind of not only the person who is ill, but the family members can be, have, have a deep sense of denial. This, this person is not going to die. My mother's not going to die. Uh, so that's, that's a stage. It's a very, very uh, difficult stage of grief. There can be the uh, second stage uh, Kubler-Ross identifies as anger. That people can be very angry when they're dying. Uh, anger. I've seen anger range from a priest who is dying at the age of 38 throwing his chalice on the floor. Real anger, just tremendous anger. And then you, uh, you see the anger acted out in other ways toward the, uh, the personnel who are dealing with them, medical people, doctors, etc., nurses, can experience uh, anger in patients. It's a very difficult time to deal with that. But it is just one of the situations that you deal with, that people get very, very angry. And uh, the response to that is a deep sense of patience. You, you can understand their anger, but you, you can't say, you, you, there's no use preaching to them and saying, do not be angry. Because it's a deep-seated feeling that people have. The third stage is bargaining. Uh, you see that especially in people who are victims of car accidents. Uh, oh God, if you take me through this, I'll go to church every Sunday for the rest of my life. That's a comment that you hear. Or, God, if you get me through this, I'll be kind to my kids and I'll change my behavior. So it's, that's kind of the bargaining behavior that is frequently, especially when it's a sudden illness, it's probably not as prevalent when uh, it's a long range illness, hospitalization, etc. But it is something very frequent uh, in sudden, sudden heart attack, sudden accident. Then you hear people uh, in emergency room saying, God, if I get through this, I'll just change my way of life. The, I remember one saying, it was a car wreck and it was a result of, uh, quote, drunk driving. And the comment was right after the anointing, he said, if 
Father, if I get through with this, I'll never take another drink. So you see that kind of bargaining that can go on. The third one, or fourth one, especially in difficult times, is uh, depression, kind of grief, depression. Uh, this is not the same as a psych clinical depression or psychological depression. That would have to be dealt with in other ways. If somebody has suffered from depression, uh, there's ways to deal with that even in the time of their death. But this is kind of the natural emotion that depression sets in. And all of you have visited people who are in the hospital and the awareness of death is there. The anger has subsided. They're not bargaining anymore. Then you just, uh, they don't want to talk. They just go quiet. And you'll get comments like, thanks for dropping by, which probably means, uh, I don't want to talk anymore. Uh, I don't want to visit. That's why in pastoral counseling, uh, Father Janovic and Father Reichwald and I, one of the things that's kind of built into pastoral care of the sick, especially in hospitals, is not to stay too long. Uh, they're tired. Their energy is down. And your first temptation is to say, well, they're depressed, I should just keep talking, working with their depression, but that probably only exacerbates it. So you kind of have to make a judgment. Uh, when is long enough, long enough? And I would much rather be on the side of maybe too short rather than too long in a person who is in the, not the clinical depression, but just in the anxiety, depression of, of dying. You sense it very quickly when they, uh, their facial expressions kind of indicate I'm tired. And when their eyes kind of uh, close and when they, uh, when they no longer are listening to you, to your comments, that's when you kind of get the idea that I have been here long enough and it would be better to let this person experience the peace of silence rather than to talk. The uh, fifth stage in the Kubler-Ross is acceptance. Uh, I know I'm dying. Uh, I know there's, there's no hope. And these are the people who will say to uh, doctors and to medical personnel, I don't want any more tests. I don't want any more surgeries. I don't want any more protocols. And most of the medical personnel are very, very astute about that. And they will say, uh, Maybe it's the time to transition to hospice in your home setting. They, once you hear that, you know that they've kind of come to an acceptance and uh, kind of a peace is coming and uh, they know that that is part of it. They appreciate people stopping by, but not for too long. And they appreciate any kind of uh, words of prayer or comfort that you can give them. Because you, you determine, and they, they said, uh, I know nothing else can be done. I, mean, I know I'm dying. And that's the way it is. So you can see that stage. So if you look back over, you can see the denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. These were stages that Kubler-Ross uh, wrote out in kind of a systematic way. When they were first published, we kind of had the idea that everybody had to go through denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. But that really, uh, these are not absolute stages. Uh, some people will bypass the bargaining, bypass the anger. Some people will never get to the state of acceptance. Some people will be in denial. 
Uh, and uh, there, were, there are people who, uh, who die that you're working with very carefully, family members, etc. You don't see any of these stages. So it's not an absolute. It's not that. And they may be the reverse. Maybe I know I'm dying. Then there may be some anger. Then there may be some expressions of bargaining. Uh, but so those will come. They're not absolute stages. The last thing you'd want to do is uh, tell somebody who is very ill, now we're going to watch to see if you go into a denial, and then anger, and then bargaining, and then depression, and then acceptance. Uh, uh, these are just ways to kind of understand what's going on in the life of a person. And not everyone will go through the five. Not everyone will go through them systematically. Uh, so they're good tools, but beware of absolutizing them. They're, they're typical relative stages for a person who is dying. And uh, the art of hospice is to kind of uh, pick up the signs of this. It was pretty easy to pick up the sign of the priest friend, but that was 40 years ago when we did, weren't that aware of it. When he finished Mass and threw his chalice on the floor, uh, it, that one would be pretty easy to pick up that he's angry. But sometimes they're pretty subtle and they don't, aren't like that. But in all of this, there's a sense of healing. Religious healing, psychological, emotional healing. And I remember one person saying to me, the only difficulty I really have in this uh, dying process is that I see the grief in people who come to visit me. Now that was somebody who was pretty astute. Said, it's just difficult to have people come in and you see them leave in tears. That's, this person, that's more difficult for me than the dying process. So it's kind of a, an art of what you express to a dying person and how you go through that. Uh, I see Father Art is here. I think I should tell him about your last experience with Father Jack when he raised his hand. It was in the homily yesterday. Uh, Father Jack knew he was dying and it was pretty clear and he didn't go through all of these stages. I remember one time when we were playing bridge, he said, I don't know if all the five stages have set in yet. <laughs> That's because he had learned them and uh, maybe kind of absolutized them a little bit too much. But when Father R went to see him the last day, about five hours, four hours before he died, uh, Father Art said, Jack, do you know we're supposed to be playing bridge today? Mm -hmm. Father Torpy, Bishop Denninger, you and I, we're supposed to be playing bridge. It's a sign. We had it scheduled for today. So he was incoherent and pretty much unconscious, but he raised his hand up and then it just fell down on the bed. So Art interpreted that as, deal the cards, dummy, what are we waiting for? <laughs> but he didn't say that. That's our interpretation of it. So if you turn this over, on the front side, again, as I call it, the five stages of grief, uh, this kind of gives a background of the five stages that we talked about on the back side. Uh, In the fourth paragraph that starts with although, I would really emphasize the last line in that. Move, some will move successfully from one stage to the next, but you don't want to put pressure on them, undue pressure on an individual saying, well, you're supposed to be angry. Uh, you don't want to do that. The chart below is uh, taken from the internet. And uh, it's a little different way of looking at it. If you looked at it, uh, there's the shock event that you see in the center. Then if you go down to the bottom left side, refusal to understand, 
incomprehension, negation, outright rejection, resistance, uh, then a catharsis, sadness, lethargy, despair, depression. This person has done that cycle, the person who designed this graph. Then you see on the other side, resignation, which is a little difficult to understand. Sometimes it's perceived as just a lack of drive and aimlessness and distrustfulness and doubt. And you may find it very difficult to deal with them when they're in that quadrant. And that then you see where it goes up, reintegration, acceptance of change, realization of some benefit, and active living engagement with the illness. Even if they know they're dying, they're engaged in that dying process. One of the things I learned from Father Joe Hannipal when uh, one of the religious sisters died, he made the comment in the homily, or in some part of the liturgy, he said, uh, Sister so-and-so did not die of cancer. Sister so-and-so lived with cancer. So I've often thought that we think they're dying of cancer, and that's what we describe, but they can be in a stage of reintegration, acceptance, and uh, they can be living with cancer. Especially with our protocols today, there are a lot of people who, who live for quite a while with cancer. And they live successfully and live uh, with a sense of resignation that, yes, I do have cancer in my body. But they can live with it in a, in a good-hearted way. In a resignation way, but a fruitful way. And they can be a tremendous inspiration to those who visit them and are with them. To go back to what I said at the beginning, uh, Personally, I do put much more uh, faith in and trust in, like the song, The Lord Heals the Brokenhearted. So that whole 2,000, 3,000 year history of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and Jesus uh, putting his hands on St. Peter's mother-in-law and healing her, as we heard about five weeks ago, uh, we don't know what the healing, whether that healing meant uh, healed in grace or healed in spirit, or whether it's a physical healing. So when you read the uh, healing accounts of Jesus, uh, they don't distinguish psychological healing, emotional healing, physical healing. Uh, it's a sense of healing, and the healing comes in various forms with Jesus. So that would be the primary way that we deal with. Uh, the testimony of Jesus and his healing stories and accounts in the New Testament. These are helpful tools to understand what's perhaps going on in my life, if I'm on the deathbed, uh, the life of others who are viewing that. So it's, uh, they're not absolute, and that's the art of hospice care to uh, try to respect and understand those who are in that grief. And whether they're, uh, they're obviously going through physical issues, they're going through emotional issues, maybe going through intellectual issues, certainly psychological issues, but that's, uh, this is just a, a set of tools to understand yourself and to understand the people that you're dealing with, family members or friends, etc. So it gives you some insight into the uh, emotional, psychological, spiritual issues. Uh, I've had a lot of people in the, in the deathbed say, quote, I'm at peace. I'm at peace with what's going on. Well, we might call that acceptance, but I think what they meant was I have a sense of the peace of Christ in my life at this point, and I'm dealing with it successfully. Uh, I know I'm going to die, but I'm at peace, and I'm at peace with the situation.